Hello and welcome to lecture 17 of the NPTEL MOOCs course on economic growth and development. Uh, today's lecture we will look at some of the contrasting uh, evaluative approaches with respect to the human development and capabilities approach. And so I have titled this lecture as uh, utilitarianism basic needs approach and the capability approach. Now, while there are various uh, competing evaluative approaches or frameworks vis-a-vis uh, -vis the capabilities approach or the human development approach, I have chosen to focus only on utilitarianism and the basic needs approach because these are uh, these have been dominant, these two approaches have been the dominant frameworks that have uh, been used to evaluate economic policies and to make value judgments for over a very large period of time and particularly in the period of the last two uh, or three decades and a half. In uh, lectures uh, 15 and 16, uh, we uh, made an introduction to uh, the human development approach. In lecture 15, we looked at uh, three important uh, uh, evaluative frameworks within which human development approach can be posited. We looked at the normative approach, the positive approach and the predictive approach. And through the help of a case study from uh, China uh, with the case of uh, environmental pollution, we also looked at the interconnectedness of uh, these uh, three frameworks and how they can be used to carry out any uh, human development analysis or uh, uh, use the capability approach uh, to understand the process of development. In lecture 15, uh, we also looked at uh, some of the assumptions uh, which has been made by growth theorists and how human development practitioners have very success, uh, successfully and legitimately challenged these uh, assumptions and shown that how there is no straightforward relationship between growth and development. In lecture 16, uh, we uh, got introduced to the concept of capabilities approach by uh, looking at uh, how to define what is a successful development. We uh, saw that there are different uh, ways of defining development, there are different ways of looking at development. We saw that development is multifaceted and then we also went on to see uh, the, the, base, the origins of capabilities approach as uh, put forward by Sen and uh, we also saw what are the basic components components of the capabilities approach. We primarily looked at uh, uh, two uh, concepts, the concept of uh, functionings, uh, we also looked at the concept of agency and we also looked at the concept of freedoms and how the con these three concepts of functionings, freedoms and agency are central to understanding the capabilities approach. In today's class, uh, uh, therefore, I uh, have uh, I have decided on looking at uh, the competing approaches to capabilities approach, or uh, to put it differently, how capabilities approach provided some sort of a challenge to the dominant frameworks that were be that have been in use in economic policy analysis uh, to be able to make value judgments with respect to uh, development. Now, to be able to do that, uh, let me begin with an example which Sen himself has taken uh, from uh, 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 and he has taken this example in his very celebrated book Development as Freedom uh, and this example can be found in his chapter 3 which is titled Freedom and the Foundations of Justice. In this example, he talks about this lady named Annapurna who uh, has to make a choice of uh, workers uh, th between three unemployed workers who are available to her. Uh, this lady Annapurna has a garden which has been unkempt for a very long period of time and uh, she has to make a choice uh, between these three workers and she knows that all the three workers uh, will be able to produce the same level of output given the amount of wages that she is willing to give them. Uh, uh, the Sen has named these three workers as Dinu, Bishanno and Rogini and Annapurna has to make a choice between these three uh, workers. Uh, to be able to make a choice uh, between uh, these three workers, she has to have access to uh, the information base regarding the capabilities of uh, these three workers or regarding the social arrangements of these three workers. The information that she has uh, regarding Dinu and to which all of them agree is that Dinu is the poorest amongst them all and he has been poor since a very long period of time to which both Vishanno and uh, Rogini agree uh, that uh, Dinu has uh, been impoverished for a considerable period of time, so much so that he has come to accept his state of poverty 
and Annapurna being a reflective person uh, begins to think that probably uh, she should give the work to Dinu because he will gain the most out of um, the work which she has to give to the workers. Now, given a standard neoclassical economics framework, uh, if Annapurna only has to uh, has, has her work uh, uh, has to get her work done, uh, the work under consideration here is to keep the garden clean, then probably she will be indifferent between the three workers. But uh, the, uh, the specific problem here is that she has access to the information about all the three uh, workers. The information regarding Bishanno that she has is that Bishanno has been recently impoverished and he has been psychologically depressed of late. And everybody agrees that among the three, Bishanno is the unhappiest among them all. And uh, she thinks that uh, probably if she gives the work to Bishanno and he uh, gets uh, some wage out of it, uh, then he will come out of the psychological depression that he has gone into. Uh, so, compare in, in uh, uh, with regard to the choice that she has to make between these three workers, she realizes that probably Bishanno is the one who should get the work. But the third set of information that she has is with regard to Rogini and uh, she comes to, uh, she gets the information that Rogini has uh, been suffering from a debilitating illness. She has been chronically ill for a very long period of time. She is poor, uh, but she is relatively poor compared to Dinu. She is, uh, she is relatively not so poor compared to uh, Dinu, but she is poorer than uh, Bishanno. However, she has been suffering from a chronic illness for over a period of time and uh, because she has been suffering from this illness for over a period of time, she has come to accept the illness very stoically. So much so that she has come to accept the situation that she is in. And Annapurna begins to think that if she has to make a choice, probably if she gives the uh, wage work to uh, Rogini, then she might be able to get rid of the illness that she is in and therefore be able to experience a better quality of life. Now, this is a very interesting example uh, that Sen uh, takes with respect to the choice that one needs to make with regard to whether to which what are the kinds of resources that needs to be made available to three different, uh, uh, three different kinds of workers. Now, in a strictly uh, economic uh, or ethical uh, sense of the term, in, in the literatures uh, with respect, uh, in the literature pertaining to economics and to ethics, uh, uh, Dinu's case would fall under the under the uh, paradigm of what is known as income egalitarian uh, approaches, and uh, Bishanno's case uh, would fall under the classical utilitarian uh, case, which concentrates most uh, mostly on the metric of pleasure and happiness as to uh, what amount of happiness one derives out of a uh, particular uh, wage work or a particular good or a service. Whereas, Rogini's case would fall under the paradigm of what is known as how to improve quality of life uh, uh, with, regard, uh, with regard to the uh, situation that uh, one is in. Now, the first two arguments with regard to income egalitarianism and utilitarianism uh, or the situation pertaining to Dinu and Bishanno are the one which has been discussed primarily in the economic and ethic ethical literatures. Whereas, uh, Rogini's uh, stance of uh, being able to provide her the opportunities of uh, being able to, uh, uh, to take care of her impoverishment because of the uh, ill health that she has been strictly falls within the paradigm of the human development approach. Now, it is in this context that now uh, let us try to connect uh, the uh, uh, connect and see how utilitarianism and basic needs approach uh, are uh, two different evaluative approaches, how we can distinguish uh, these two approaches from the human development of the capabilities approach, what are the interconnections between the utilitarian uh, approach and the basic needs approach and how all of these three approaches together can uh, inform us well with regard to uh, policy making. Now, what are the basic features of uh, utilitarianism? Uh, let us uh, look at some of them. The fundamental principle of utilitarianism is that it is based on the notion of utility. 
and this utilitarian notion of value which is invoked explicitly or by implication in much of welfare economics it sees value ultimately only in individual utility which is defined in terms of some mental condition such as pleasure or happiness or uh, desire fulfillment now one must understand here that human development and the capability approach arose in conversation with the various competing approaches and these approaches of utilitarianism and basic needs approach had been existing before the capabilities approach made its appearance in the on the scene and it is in this context that one needs to look at what are the limitations of uh, the approach of utilitarianism or what are the limitations of uh, focusing only on metric of pleasure and happiness and how uh, focusing on capabilities can give us a better lens or a better evaluative framework uh, to be able to come up with uh, better policy making or uh, value judgments uh, regarding uh, the state of uh, development. So, utilitarianism holds that the best state of affairs is that in which the sum total of utility is a maximum and one of the improvements of utilitarianism is called uh, choice utilitarianism which gets rid of the principle of summing utility by either or all choices by economic agents rather than being concerned with adding up values. Utilitarianism is uh, one of the uh, basic premises of most of the neoclassical approaches to economic policy making and it is here that uh, uh, it needs to be pointed that utilitarianism was a sort of appeal to governments to let the market do its work without interference to justify self seeking by proving that the greatest good for the greatest number is achieved by individualistic self seeking. Therefore, the basic premise of neoclassical economics is that the individual knows best, the individual is always working towards maximizing her utility, maximizing and because in economics, uh, because there are practical limitations of being able to uh, measure happiness or measure pleasure. Uh, in economics, we, uh, provi we provide numbers to utility in the form of utils and uh, therefore, the basic premise of neoclassical economics is that consumers are always working towards utility maximization and uh, utility maximization basically means that the consumer is working towards maximization of her uh, satisfaction. Now, uh, let us look at some of the uh, components of uh, classical utilitarianism. There have been various improvements or various extensions of the concept of uh, utilitarianism, but here let us consider only the uh, concept of classical utilitarianism and some of the components of classical utilitarianism are as follows. Uh, there are primarily three, they are consequentialism, welfareism and uh, some ranking. The component of uh, consequentialism says that it, it stands for the claim that all choices or actions, institutions and so on must be judged by their consequences that is by the results uh, that they generate. So, what is this uh, component uh, uh, saying? This component is saying that all actions or all choices that are made by individuals must be finally, finally uh, valued in terms of what are the consequences of uh, the uh, of their actions. So, let us take an example. In uh, the last class, uh, I had taken the example of reservation as a policy. Now, if the reservation uh, as a policy uh, uh, in, in terms of providing a preferential treatment or affirmative action to some of the marginalized groups of population creates some kind of a distortion within the society, then probably uh, going by the uh, component of consequentialism of utilitarianism, it will not be looked at as a very, as, uh, as a very, uh, as a potent tool for uh, for uh, providing uh, benefits or, provi or or providing justice to people within the society therefore by the component of the component of consequentialism basically completely negates the idea uh, that uh, of uh, social justice which says that there are certain things which are inherently important or intrinsically important to be able to carry out uh, to be able to uh, uh, to be able to provide some form of uh, social justice so, the component of consequentialism goes further than demanding only consequence sensitivity since it rules out that anything other than consequences can ultimately matter. So, how much of a restriction is imposed by consequentialism has to be judged further, but it is worth mentioning that 
this must partly depend on what is or is not included in the list of consequences. So, whether an action performed can be seen as one of the consequences of that action in an obvious sense it clearly is. The second component of utilitarianism is uh, welfareism and uh, this component is referred to as the judgment of the relative goodness of alternative states of affairs which must be based exclusively on and taken as an increasing function of the respective collections of individual utilities in these states. Now, the component of welfareism basically does not pay any direct attention to things such as fulfillment or violation of uh, rights and duties and so on. And when welfareism is combined with consequentialism, we get the requirement that every choice must be judged by the respective utilities it generates. So, for example, any action uh, is judged by the consequent state of affairs and the consequent state of affairs is judged by utilities in that state because of welfareism. So, in terms of welfareism, we are basically looking at what are the total benefits derived out of a particular economic policy to a certain section or to the total population without consideration to whether we are uh, taking uh, note of the uh, violation of rights and duties, violation of human rights and duties within. Uh, uh, within a policy uh, framework. The third component of classical utilitarianism is that of some ranking and this basically says that the utilities of different people need to be simply summed up together to get their aggregate merit without paying attention to the distribution of the total over the individuals. And these all these three components uh, are uh, define uh, utilitarianism and goes to show uh, how it can stand against the capabilities approach. And the capability approach entails a critique of other evaluative approaches, mainly of the welfareism approaches in welfare economics and on utilitarian and income based or resources based uh, theories. So, Sen basically criticizes utility as a measure of well being and he points out that functioning is a more rational measure of well being than opulence or command over a mass of commodities or utility which is the value of uh, desired objects. Now, much of as I have already pointed out, much of uh, conventional uh, economics is based on uh, utilitarian approaches and uh, uh, the and it is very dif difficult to uh, come up with a metric of pleasure or happiness on, on, uh, on a regular uh, basis. Uh, Sen takes the example of uh, a bicycle. A bicycle by itself is a resource uh, which may be able to provide uh, utility to different people on different counts. Now, somebody who loves to ride a bicycle for uh, for being mobile or from or for being able to move from one region to the other will be able to enjoy the resource uh, which is which in this case here is a bicycle. However, if somebody uh, is uh, disabled or is differently abled uh, will uh, not be able to use the resource bicycle uh, very usefully uh, so that it can uh, provide her or him some kind of a utility. So, you, so uh, you, if the focus is largely on utilitarianism as an approach, then there are uh, th there is a limitation of being able to uh, to translate or to be able to transform the utility, uh, transform the resource into specific forms of uh, functionings. Now, Sen uh, in his paper that came out in the British Medical Journal in 2002 took the example of two states, uh, Kerala and uh, Bihar to be able to come up with a more uh, relevant um, uh, to, to be able to come up with a more uh, relevant example of how utilitarianism can prove to be a limitation vis-a-vis -vis the capabilities approach. Now, in 2002, uh, Kerala had uh, some of one of the highest uh, literacy rate in India. It had almost universal education and a life expectancy of 74 at that time, whereas Bihar had a life expectancy of about less than 60 years. And uh, there was a test of, uh, uh, there was a survey which was carried out uh, in which the individuals were asked to uh, report, uh, was were asked to report on morbidity condition. So, it was a self reporting of morbidity condition regarding how uh, ill they have, how ill individuals have been over a period of time. 
And based upon this uh, survey, it was found out that the self-reported morbidity in Kerala was much more higher than that in uh, Bihar. Now, the human development indicators have uh, shown us or the, uh, the, the information on infant mortality rate and under 5 mortality rate have shown us that Kerala is a much healthier state than Bihar is, but the individual metric of utility the individual metric of pleasure, the individual metric of happiness of uh, people, how people subjectively value their happiness is very different. So, uh, while objectively Kerala was much more uh, highly ranked in terms of morbidity status, the uh, subjective valuation of well-being by the people of Kerala showed that they have very high uh, morbidity conditions, whereas the subjective valuation of morbidity in Bihar showed that they have very low uh, morbi morbidity conditions. Now, what does this mean? This means that the, the subjective valuation of people uh, is largely determined by the social arrangements within which people exist and the social arrangements within which people exist largely influences what they think about their state of happiness and uh, therefore the objective valuation the subjective valuation may be may may be very different from each other and sometimes may also go in opposing directions so then the question arises how do we evaluate this if the subjective valuation and the objective valuation are very different from each other and subjective valuation is largely guided by uh, the, uh, the evaluative framework of uh, utilitarianism, then how do we uh, evaluate a development policy or the how do we initiate a development policy, how do we implement a different uh, uh, a development policy and that is where the capabilities approach has an answer where instead of trying to look at what is the uh, uh, how happy people are or what is the subjective valuation of happiness of people, probably it will make more sense to focus more on the capabilities of people or the opportunities that people have to be able to transform their utility into functionings. So, in that sense, the capability approach entails a critique of the utilitarian approach, uh, mainly the welfareism component of the utilitarian approach and Sen in his uh, book Development as Freedom mentions that the judgments of states of affairs to the utilities in the respective states paying no direct attention to such things as the fulfillment or violation of rights, duties and so on. So, he rejects such theories because whatever their future further specifications, they rely exclusively on utility and thus exclude non-utility information from our moral judgments. So, uh, if you go back to the example that I began with in the beginning of uh, this lesson uh, regarding uh, Annapurna being able to make a choice between Dino, Vishanno and uh, Rogini, if uh, Annapurna did not have information about the health conditions of Rogini or the current psychological uh, predicament that Bishanno was in probably uh, guided by the idea of income egalitarian approach the job would have gone to uh, Dinu. Uh, similarly, guided by the idea of giving the greatest happiness to the person who desires uh, the job, the job would have gone to Bishanno. Uh, however, to be able to uh, uh, when one is focusing on the idea of capabilities, probably the idea the job would have gone to uh, Rogini. So, it is a very difficult choice to make and the choice that is to be ultimately made depends upon the information base uh, that the policy makers have access to. So, here Annapurna is a policy maker, she has to make a choice of giving a work to three different kinds of workers who are all unemployed and who all require the work, who all will provide the same level of output uh, given the same kinds of wages. However, the choice has to be very carefully made. And this is at the heart of most of the policy, uh, economic policies with respect to poverty and nutrition uh, that uh, or employment or social security that one has to make in the context of uh, developing countries. So, uh, this is at the heart of most of the uh, universal or targeted programs that uh, the governments have to make a choice about uh, for bringing about uh, 
uh, well-being to different sections of the population. When we talk about uh, the concepts of below poverty line and above poverty line or when we talk about uh, uh, malnourished children and how targeted interventions or supplementary nutrition feeding programs should be made to these malnourished uh, children, we are basically trying to make a uh, choice with regard to the information base that we have uh, with respect to the different uh, groups of population within a society. The other competing approach is uh, what is referred to as the basic needs approach. And the basic needs approach is uh, one of the major approaches to measurement of absolute poverty in developing countries. It was introduced by the ILO uh, in 1976 and it is a practice and policy oriented approach. Uh, Francis Stewart to whom I have introduced to in uh, the earlier classes on uh, strategies of economic growth and development was one of the pioneering uh, persons who uh, spoke and wrote about the basic needs approach. In terms of the writings of Francis Stewart, he says that basic needs approach basically gives priority to meeting people's basic needs to ensuring that there are sufficiently appropriately distributed basic needs, goods and services to sustain all human lives at a minimally decent level. So, basic needs embraces the components of previous strategies and approaches such as rural development, urban poverty alleviation, employment creation through small scale industries, redistribution with growth and other poverty, employment and equity oriented approaches. When the basic needs approach was uh, introduced, it was considered to be a new element. The new element is that there is a shift of emphasis towards social services designed to help and mobilize the poor and an extension of new style projects in nutrition, health health and education. Now, the basic needs approach has uh, um, also been referred to as providing resources to people and the development discourse over the period of uh, uh, 1980s and the 1990s has focused a lot on distributing resources to people, providing assets to people, uh, uh, say uh, in the form of uh, uh, say in the form of, uh, you must have heard of various kinds of self-employment programs of the 1990s. For example, in India we had uh, what is referred to as the integrated rural development program which was some form of a self-employment program in which certain amenities were provided to people and uh, to households and they were supposed to create employ, uh, they were supposed to create, uh, uh, generate wage, uh, generate incomes out of the uh, assets that were provided to them. So, for example, if a tailoring machine has been provided to a household, uh, the, the tailoring machine is a resource that has been provided by the government to the household and the household is supposed to generate incomes out of the resource. However, the basic limitation of providing resource uh, uh, which has been uh, referred to as resourcism uh, in, uh, uh, in the larger uh, discourse of uh, development uh, um, uh, practice or development studies is that uh, who should get the resources becomes the moot question. Uh, uh, if, if we go back to the same example of uh, Dinu, Bishano and uh, Rogini. If instead of providing a wage work uh, to these three workers, some kind of a resource was provided to the three workers to be able to generate income, how does one make a, uh, how does one decide, how does one make a choice regarding who to give the uh, resources to? And that is one of the basic limitations of the uh, basic needs uh, approach uh, as well. So, these approaches recognize the uh, fundamental, uh, both the utilitarian approach and the basic needs approach recognize the fundamental importance of material goods and uh, uh, of resources that can help transform or that can help provide functionings uh, to uh, people and uh, households. So, as I have already uh, just discussed now, to summarize uh, the basic uh, foundations of the basic needs approach, the BNA focuses on the end of mobilizing particular resources for particular groups identified as deficient in these resources, example calorie adequacy by age, sex and activity. They are not just deciles in an abstract scale of income distribution. The basic needs approach concentrates on the nature of what is provided and its impact on needs rather than on income alone. Nor does it replace concepts that are means to broader ends such as productivity, production and growth. 
but it derives from the end of meeting basic human needs, the need for changing the composition of output, the rates of growth of its different components, distribution of purchasing power and design of social services. So, BNA represents a stage in the evolution of analysis and uh, policy. And how does the capabilities approach become an alternative to the basic needs approach? The BNA also places people at the center of development because the focus is on providing resources uh, to people so that they can be best able to transform these resources into uh, development. But the emphasis uh, is on specifying basic needs in terms of supplying services and commodities which points to a commodities basis rather than a capabilities basis in defining human well-being. So, if one has to simplify uh, in terms of an example as to how the basic needs approach is different from uh, the capabilities approach. The basic needs approach would uh, suppose there is a child uh, who uh, is uh, willing to go to school and does not have the institutional apparatus uh, require the institutional support required to be able to complete her schooling. Uh, let us say there is a primary school in a certain village and there is a child who needs to go to the primary school, but she does not have a uniform, she does not have uh, the resources of books, she does not have uh, 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 pencils uh, on in, on, uh, th in which to write in. So, the basic needs approach would focus on providing the resources of uniform or bags or books so that she can be able to go to school. However, the capabilities approach would rather focus on ensuring that the government provides the institutional framework uh, such as the schooling framework the, uh, uh, and, be, and ensuring that people, the, uh, the parents of the concerned child have enough capabilities to be able to send the children to school. So, the focus with respect to basic needs approach is in supplying the commodities, whereas the capabilities approach is looking at enhancement of capabilities and that requires a much bigger emphasis compared to the basic needs approach because that requires an institutional change that requires a change in the social arrangements within which the uh, child uh, functions. So, capabilities approach focuses more on the situation of individuals than the basic needs approach. It does not recommend the delivery of the same basic goods to everyone, but rather that we take human diversity as much as possible into account and it applies to all human beings also hence also to the rich, whereas the BNA has generally been perceived as focused on poor people in poor countries. In the last class, I was uh, taking the example of uh, um, a boy and a girl, uh, both of whom uh, need to go to school. A poor boy uh, coming from a poorer family background and because of impoverish, impoverishment within the family not being able to go to school, whereas a girl child coming from a relatively not so poor household. However, because of cultural uh, uh, restraints, because of social restraints not being allowed to go to school. So, both these children face a capability deprivation of being able to go to school uh, uh, and the basic needs approach would ensure that the, uh, the, the, the concerned boy is uh, provided with certain resources say a bicycle or uh, books so that he can at least uh, uh, have some opportunity of being able to go to school. Similarly, the uh, girl child uh, may be provided with some uh, basic amenities or uh, benefits so that the parents are induced to send their girl child to school. However, the capabilities approach focuses on challenging the notions of uh, uh, not sending the girl child to school and therefore requires a multifaceted approach of challenging the social arrangements within which uh, the both the children are situated in. So, in the case of the boy child, uh, the institutional arrangements can be brought into place so that the parents of the concerned children or the adults within the family are provided enough support so that they are able to ultimately send their children to school and that is the basic difference between the basic needs approach and the CA. So, if we have to summarize the key features of CA and the basic needs approach, in terms of the conceptual basis, basic needs approach um, uh, looks at the fact that people must have minimum subsistence. So, they must have access to uh, food and shelter and clothing and drinking water and sanitation and so on. The capabilities approach focuses 
on the fact that people should have equal freedom to choose their valued ways of life. So, in the example that I just took about the girl child uh, facing a social constraint of not being able to go to school, uh, the basic needs approach, uh, the premise of the, the principle based on which the BNA is uh, based upon will not be able to deal with the uh, problem that the girl child that is facing in such a situation. However, the capabilities approach should be able to deal with the situation as it is trying to challenge the social arrangements within which the girl child is situated in and therefore is uh, working towards uh, providing equal freedom to choose their valued ways of life. In terms of poverty uh, definition, the BNA is looking at deprivation of consumption. So, for example, the BNA uh, would largely be concerned about what is the calorie deficiency of uh, individuals within a household or certain households within a certain community. They are primarily looking at the outcome indicators of households uh, by how much there is a deficiency uh, with regard to consumption. However, the capabilities approach in terms of the poverty uh, you know, definition is looking at deprivations of opportunities, whether the individuals within uh, a household or a community have the opportunity to be able to access the uh, resources or access the benefits, uh, access uh, different kinds of commodities within a given setup. So, to be able to give you an example again of the same kind where the poverty definition in terms of CA would be looking at whether there are sufficient policies in place, whether there is a law in place that can uh, take advantage, that can be taken advantage of in being able to send a girl child to school. And uh, the, and there will be a participation of uh, civil society and NGO activists and educationists and the community at large to be able to uh, send the girl child to, to school. In terms of the feature of poverty reduction, the basic needs approach ensures adequate access to consumption, whereas the capabilities approach ensures equal opportunities so that people can make choice. In terms of policy objectives, the basic needs approach is focusing on subsistence and therefore the basic needs approach is a more targeted approach. It is looking at a certain section of population within a country or within a community which are downtrodden, who are deprived and therefore certain basic uh, needs need to be provided to them. So, it is looking at only at a subsistence level whereas capabilities approach which is trying to meet the needs of all sections of the community uh, or the entire population looking at various facets of, uh, um, uh, of development of an individual is a more empowering, has a more empowering policy objective. In terms of power relationship, the basic needs approach is paternalistic, it has little scope for voice of the poor. Whereas the capabilities approach is deliberative, people share concerns and shape policies. Now, the feature of paternalism is implicit in most of the uh, uh, um, economic policies that are guided by basic needs approach because here the poorer people themselves do not have a voice or do not have a say with regard to what is it that they need. It is the government or it is the policy maker that decides on their behalf regarding what are the resources that need to be uh, provided to them. And for a very long period of time, the, the design and the implementation of development policies has been such that it has been touted as being highly paternalistic in nature and it is a one way relationship where it is the policy, the, where it is only the policy maker that has to decide what is right or wrong for the uh, people, but the people themselves do not have a voice with regard to what is it that they require. Whereas the capabilities approach brings about a shift in uh, thinking uh, in development policy and practice where uh, the community interaction, where the community comes ahead and uh, uh, make, makes the policy maker uh, 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 and lets the policy maker know what is it that they require. Therefore, citizen participation is intrinsic to the power relationship of the capabilities approach. In terms of the feature of the level of application, basic needs approach is generalized and it does not allow regional diversity, whereas capabilities approach has multiple levels and it emphasizes on localizations. 
and based upon these uh, key features or distinguishing features of uh, capabilities approach and the basic needs approach, SEN identified five uh, vital factors that are overlooked when we focus on income and uh, resources instead of uh, capabilities. Uh, they are referred to as uh, the following. The first of them all is uh, personal heterogeneities. That is uh, when we are looking, when we are trying to frame, when a policy maker is trying to frame a development policy, personal heterogeneities are not kept in mind. So for example, if there is a pregnant woman and an elderly woman, and if certain uh, women centric policies are uh, being uh, uh, designed uh, to be implemented, uh, one needs to keep in mind that the needs of different uh, of uh, women in different regions are different. So, for example, the needs of a pregnant woman will be very different from the needs of a girl child or the needs of a teenager or the needs of an elderly woman. So, personal heterogeneities are generally overlooked when we are focusing more on income. To make it more simpler, uh, let us say that uh, uh, there is a development policy which is to be implemented and the overwhelming objective of the development policy is to increase incomes of households. But one needs to understand that households have different members and there are uh, the members belonging to different uh, uh, gender and they have different needs, there are different needs within the uh, families and because intra-household distribution of resources are not equal, therefore there are personal heterogeneities and while designing and implementing development policies, one needs to keep in mind the personal heterogeneities. However, these are generally overlooked when the uh, focus is largely on income and resources. Similarly, uh, environmental diversities, suppose there is a pensioner in Scotland and there is a pensioner in India, the, uh, the needs and the social arrangements within which these people exist are very different and therefore environmental diversities also needs to be kept in mind when we are uh, looking at uh, evaluative frameworks. Thirdly, SEN identifies institutional variations as something which is very important when we are looking at development frameworks. So, for example, there are parents in a country which has a free public education uh, in place where there is a lot of institutional support with regard to uh, uh, education of their children. And there are parents in a country where, uh, where there is no public education, uh, education is completely privatized. Then the responses of the parents to providing a good quality of education to the children will be very different in these two sets of countries. And therefore, there are so it needs to be kept in mind that different countries or different regions have different institutional variations and therefore, the capabilities of individuals are also very different. So, for example, if you have a country which has a completely free healthcare system and you have a country which has a very privatized healthcare system, then the, uh, the, the basic uh, standards of living of these two countries will be very different because then uh, if, a, if a person falls ill in the first country, then the, there is a lot of support, there is a lot of institutional support in uh, helping the, uh, in, in being uh, able to uh, provide a well-being condition for the individual in the first country. But in the second country, in a highly privatized system, uh, the and if the numbers of people, uh, the if the if the overall population is uh, uh, poor, then uh, th th there's a very less chance of uh, uh, of well-being in uh, the second country. So these institutional variations need to be kept in mind before uh, coming up or designing a public policy or designing a development policy and this is also something which is generally overlooked when income and resources are the overwhelming uh, evaluative frameworks or development frameworks uh, to uh, which guides development policies. Similarly, he is also talking about differences in uh, relational perspectives and uh, this is something very important which the capabilities approach uh, harps on. Uh, the, uh, the relational perspectives basically refers to the cultural, uh, so the cultural uh, setup within which individuals uh, function. So, for example, uh, in a country which is uh, highly uh, regressive in terms of uh, providing opportunities to women will uh, have a different setup than a country which is highly progressive in terms of providing opportunities to women. And these relational perspectives uh, will provide a different sense of well-being uh, 
uh, uh, to women in both of these countries and therefore the differences in relational perspectives needs to be kept in mind with regard to uh, development policy. And lastly distribution within the family is very important. This is something that human development practitioners have been uh, uh, talking about for a considerably long period of time. It has been proved from empirical exercises that uh, simply increasing uh, incomes of a family is not enough because while uh, family incomes might have risen over a period of time, the distribution of resources within the family might be highly unequal as a result of which and this is uh, this shows up in uh, some of the indicators with regard to uh, child health and particularly women's health uh, within the households where it has been seen that uh, women seeking treatment for their health is considerably low because there is uh, unequal distribution of resources within the family and also because uh, the uh, the importance provide given to women and, uh, and children's health is very low compared to the um, uh, to the uh, adult uh, uh, healthy uh, the, to the male adult uh, within the family who is the uh, who is or uh, is the breadwinner or is a potential uh, breadwinner so in order to assess uh, people's well being further information is needed on other aspects of people's lives their health education nutritional status dignity autonomy and uh, so on and uh, Therefore, when we are looking at uh, an evaluative framework uh, to be able to come up with a development policy, one uh, needs to understand wh where the focus should be on, whether the focus should be on resources, whether the focus should be on uh, incomes or whether the focus should be on opportunities of being able to generate these uh, incomes and resources. And uh, the, uh, uh, the capabilities approach has been unequivocal in saying that in pointing out that the focus should be on opportunities or uh, capabilities. Let me end this uh, lesson by taking the uh, famous bicycle example again of Sen. The a bicycle provides a good example of how these different concepts can be related. Utilitarianism, basic needs approach or resourcesism and uh, capabilities approach. So, a person may own or a, be able to use a bicycle which is a, a resource uh, here. By riding the bicycle, the person becomes uh, mobile, moves from one place to the other. However, if the person is unable to ride the bicycle, then having a bicycle would not in fact result in this functioning. So, bicycle as a resource provides a functioning, the functioning here is mobility and this functioning provides the capability to be able to move around maybe in search of wages or being able to enter into various kinds of association with different kinds of people creating social networks and so on which will ultimately provide utility or pleasure. But if the person is unable to ride the bicycle then having a bicycle would not in fact result in this functioning. Now in this case the access to the resource coupled with a person's own characteristics creates the capability for the person to move around from one place to the other. Now let us suppose that the person enjoys having this capability to leap upon a bicycle and pedal over to a friend, friend's house for lunch thus having this capability contributes to happiness or uh, utility. Now this bicycle example illustrates how the various concepts are all related to one another when they coincide nicely. The question is which concept do we focus on? which will be distorted more or less often and the capability approach argues that utility can be distorted by personality or adaptive preferences, functionings can be enjoyed in a prison or stifled environment and a bicycle can be useless if you cannot balance. So, capability represents the most accurate space in which to investigate and advance the various forms of human well-being. So, the capabilities approach invariably focuses on uh, the capabilities uh, to be able to uh, transform the functionings into different forms of utility. In the next class, uh, we will uh, look at, uh, we will go into a more simple, uh, we, we will, I will simplify much of these uh, terms uh, for you. However, I will end this uh, class with some of the, uh, with a list of central human capabilities that Martha Nussbaum has come up with. Professor Amartya Sen never came up with a list of capabilities that are central to human development whereas uh, Nussbaum came up with a list 
uh, of uh, central human capabilities which will add to uh, human development and they are as follows as is being shown on your slide. They are first one is life which is that one should be able to live to the end of a human life of normal length or in other words not die prematurely. So, that is one of the central human capabilities of being able to lead a good life, a healthy life and not facing a premature death. One should be able to escape uh, morbidity conditions and that is one of the central human capabilities and that also means th and that is possible only when there are uh, good institutional arrangements in a society that can help one to escape morbidity conditions. Second is bodily health related though bodily health. This means that one should be able to have good health including reproductive health to be adequately nourished to have adequate shelter and this is very important in the context of uh, reproductive rights with respect to women and this is one of the central human capabilities mentioned by Nussbaum. Third is bodily integrity which means that one should be able to move freely from one place to the other to secure against violent assault including sexual assault and domestic violence, having opportunities for sexual satisfaction and for choice in matters of uh, reproduction. The third is uh, senses, imagination and uh, thought that is one should be able to use the senses to imagine, think and reason, be able to use imagination and thought, be able to use one's mind in ways protected by guarantees of freedom of expression and so on. Third is emotions that is one should be able to love, to grieve, to experience longing, gratitude and justified anger, not having one's emotional development blighted by fear and anxiety. Practical reason that is one should be able to form a conception of the good and to engage in critical reflection about uh, planning of uh, one's life. Third is uh, then next is affiliation that is one should be able to live with and towards others to recognize and show concern for other human beings. One should have the social basis of self-respect and non-humiliation. Then other species one should be able to live with concern for and in relation to animals, plants and the world of nature. One should be able to laugh, to play and enjoy recreational activities, control over one's environment, there should be political security and material security. One should be able to participate effectively in political choices, protection of free speech and association. There should be property rights on an equal basis, right to seek employment on an equal basis and so on. So what do these all of these list of central human capabilities uh, what is the point that this is driving home? It is driving home the point that income or richness of income cannot be the overwhelming objective of what is referred to as successful development. Successful development can take place only when capabilities have been uh, improved and when uh, the opportunities of being able to secure freedoms uh, by the individuals have been uh, secured. And that is where uh, a, a working list of central human capabilities has been worked out by Professor uh, Martha Nussbaum. These are some of the references which I have used to make comparison and contrast between the capabilities approach, the BNA and the utilitarian approach. In the next class, I will simplify this entire uh, lecture for you by bringing in more examples of how these approaches are competing and contrasting with each other and uh, I will also look at uh, the uh, human development indices that have been uh, constructed and worked out uh, to be able to uh, come up with country comparisons of levels of development. So, we will look at the human development index and the gender development index and some of the other indices uh, if time permits else we will continue with the uh, construction of indices in the following classes. Thank you very much.